I just want to welcome you on behalf of NYU and Joint Diseases and all the uh, organizers and our faculty to this course, which many of you know has been running uh, uninterrupted since the 1950s. So it's really a spectacular honor for us to be able to be here again this year. I, I was asked to take two issues on this morning. One was to give a, a very high-level overview of where we're at with rheumatoid pathogenesis 2013. So think of that as the airline map of the United States. But I'm not going to be terribly granular. I just want everyone at the beginning of this superb course to have a very high-level view of where you then place the detail. I'm going to tell you three very short stories, and each makes a different point. Well, I've studied for the last 10 to 15 years, sadly, gosh, it's that long, the biology of the synovial macrophage. So here he is. They bind to the end of messenger RNA. And when they bind to a messenger RNA, that messenger RNA is, is broken. If a microRNA goes up, its target protein goes down. Okay? Great. So what I'd like to discuss today is uh, some of the mechanisms by which, uh, uh, by which the bone is destroyed and deformed in, in such diseases as rheumatoid arthritis. I will skip over very briefly uh, what happens in psoriatic uh, arthritis and enthesopathies because uh, I think uh, really one, one of the world's experts is talking after me and I think he's got a lot more to say about it. Psoriatic arthritis, as we all know, is, uh, is somewhat different. Uh, it's more destructive and uh, you, uh, uh, you get things like this pencil and cup uh, deformity. And let me turn and talk about another form of uh, inflammatory arthritis. Uh, that we've uh, become interested in, and it's, uh, it's a problem of, uh, of, that's increasing as, uh, uh, as we age, and that is uh, periprosthetic uh, osteolysis. This is the first year I've been able to show a slide uh, showing uh, clinical trial results where at least on the bottom there are three of them that met their primary endpoints. So we have had a major sea change in the outlook for lupus clinical trials uh, since I began this thing. This, this is not an exhaustive list of all the clinical trials, multicenter clinical trials that have been completed for lupus, uh, and it is not even a fraction of all of the ones that are currently being entertained. So here we have a trial that sort of modestly decreased again the amount of background medications. We've got the placebo group doing worse, we've got the treatment group doing about the same, and we have a promising trial design that might be able to go into phase three studies and maybe lead to regulatory approval. So there I'm sort of building this case that maybe we're just giving too many background meds, at least for the patients in the non-nephritis trials who might not have organ-threatening illness that would keep us from being too aggressive. I, I wanted to talk about infections, and I wanted to do this uh, a little differently. Um, you know, I'm a kind of a virus guy. I, on Tuesdays, I always say I work in rheumatology giving people viral infections, and on Thursday, I work in infectious disease treating the viral infections. So, you know, Wednesday is kind of an option day. So now let me shift gears and talk a little bit about hepatitis B, a more common infection um, uh, that uh, infects almost a half a billion people in the world. HBV is a, a de-accelerating pathogen. Uh, global um, immunization has done a lot. I wanted to, I have a couple stories I'm going to tell you today about some children, and I wanted to tell you about when my baby was sitter was sick uh, last year. And that's uh, really the crux of a lot of the things I want to talk to you about. My baby was sick, babysitter was sick, and then I had to bring my little one to daycare. And I was in this play group, and there was this kid limping around with this big, long, hardware. A lot of kids have hardware when they see orthopedists. So he was walking around with this long piece of hardware and over her, the mom, she was like, something's wrong. Something's wrong with his knee. They can't figure it out. He saw this person. He saw that person. But his knee, I think his knee's swollen. And I was like in the play group and I was like, I really want to examine this kid. I really want to examine this kid. And lo and behold, two weeks later, this kid walks into my office or hobbles into my office. And the story goes that this kid has had a monoarticular arthritis for nine months. For nine months, and I'll show you a picture of his leg. For nine months, and this is a child who has seen pediatric subspecialists, including pediatric orthopedists, 
and pediatric sports medicine physicians. And for nine months this went on, which is upsetting to me as a pediatric rheumatologist, especially since we're not in Wyoming where there isn't a pediatric rheumatologist. So I want to talk to you about juvenile idiopathic arthritis today. I want to tell you about the next clinical, the next subtype, and this is a stolen, actually, and the name Polly is stolen from one pediatric rheumatologist, but I like the name. And this is literally a, a mom that the mom told me that this girl cried when she opened up a box of crayons. It